Madam Clarkson, Ambassador Mamadov, past presidents, members and guests, today's speech is about sovereignty. How could I possibly reflect the obvious angst and concern that people in this room and quite literally around the world have with this country's, with the speaker's country? The world is angry, frustrated, anxious, and sad. I could start with the events of the past few months. I could speak of the international outrage expressed by global superpowers resulting in the relocation of the G8, or is it the G7, meeting this June. I could start with a quote by Leo Tolstoy or Anton Chekhov, but nothing I say can genuinely express the meeting and the, uh, the sentiment of this meeting or for that matter, the sentiment in legislatures and parliaments around the world. Just this morning, U.S. Vice President Joseph Biden gave Russia a stern and direct warning to comply with the terms of the Geneva Accord. Mr. Ambassador, having lived in Canada for over a decade, you know Canada and you know Canadians. You know that we are a peaceful nation with an enormous influence on global human behavior. We are proud of our diversity and protective of our citizenship and fundamental freedoms. Mr. Ambassador, I need not tell you that in light of what's happening in the world today, your address to the Empire Club and to the thousands of people that are watching is courageous, to say the least. Thank you for offering your country's perspective to this club today. The Empire Club offers this podium as a podium of free speech. And although many of the people in this room and around the world may not agree with what you have to say today, you are our guest, and you are most welcome here, sir. Russia has had an enormous influence on the world as we know it, through art, culture, science, and politics. Most of these great gifts to the modern world have been highlighted and celebrated at the recent Olympic Games in Sochi. For two weeks this winter, the entire world celebrated all things Russian. Classical music, literature, ballet, scientific advancements, caviar, and vodka. The first words in space were uttered in the Russian language by Yuri Gugarin. How beautiful is this planet? Let us preserve it, not destroy it. Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to have Her Excellency the Right Honorable Adrian Clarkson, 26th Governor General of Canada, here today. Madam Clarkson represented Canada around the world and had the honor of receiving Ambassador Mamadov when he presented his credentials to the Government of Canada in 2003. The Empire Club is pleased to provide its podium to His Excellency Georgiev Mamadov, Russian Federation Ambassador to Canada. Mr. Mamadov is the Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, which means that he's the longest serving foreign ambassador in Canada. Dr. Mamadov graduated from Moscow State Institute of International Relations and holds a PhD in history. Has been, he has been in the Russian diplomatic service since 1972. In that time, the, the ambassador has served his country in the United States and is widely recognized as one of Russia's experts in North America. Prior to his appointment as the Russian Federation's ambassador, Dr. Mamadov was Russian's, uh, the Russian Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. Ambassador Mamadov was one of Russia's key envoys for diplomatic discussions with the White House, the United Nations, and NATO. Ladies and gentlemen, the ambassador of the Russian Federation. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's almost like homecoming because I remember I made that presentation several years ago here. Of course, not everybody was present. Uh, I was told I have 20 minutes to blow everything apart, <laughs> to take the barn down, you know, and then to field provocative questions. 
So I will try to accommodate that. But before, I just want to say a few words. It's my 11th year in Canada. And uh, I was a happy man here. Before that, I wasted 30 years of my life on negotiating nuclear arms with the United States. <laughs> and you imagine how inconsequential and dull it was. <laughs> During Cuban Missile Crisis, other crises, when everybody was on the brink of extinction, we just discussed the small things together. And we survived, and I'm very happy that we're together in this room, being able to discuss another tragic and controversial problem. Uh, I'm proud of what we were able to achieve together with Canadians over this 11 years. First, Arctic Treaty on, you know, uh, uh, search and rescue was signed thanks to the initiative of Canadian and Russian military people. Now it's uh, plus for all Arctic nations. It was mentioned by our host that the pinnacle of our cooperation was, of course, assuring security of Olympics. You remember all this, you know, terrible prognosis about terrorism, lack of human rights, and uh, uh, even people suggesting one shouldn't go to Sochi. And now I hope we can share in the success. I was never so deeply involved in your special services. I hope somebody in this room represents them. And I want to hail them and salute them for cooperation they provided us on keeping both your and our sportsmen, everybody else, safe and secure. And recently, there was a meeting of very important, there are many, you know, businessmen in this room, so you all appreciate the importance of a G20 group, which was launched by your former Prime Minister, Mr. Martin, and uh, he gave us a lot of uh, very interesting advice on how to uh, organize G20 group last year in St. Petersburg. And recently, just a couple of months ago, Sherpas of G20 met again, and they were actually working based on what we agreed in St. Petersburg. And the important part of this agreement was consensus between Canadian economists and Russian economists. And I want to pay tribute especially to your Minister of Finance, for uh, late Minister of Finance, Mr. Flaherty, who did a tremendous contribution in the success of G20 in St. Petersburg, and I hopeful, hope there will be equally successful one in uh, Australia. So we did a lot over these years, but the most important part, of course, was to know Canadians. Uh, I was very happy to hear our host who reiterated that you are peaceful people, that you care about the world, because I know it all. I live here, and uh, whenever we have some little free time with my wife, we would not go, you know, uh, to casino or uh, to try and risk my pittance of a salary, but uh, rather go to Perth, to Marrickwell, to other little township which remind me so very much of Russia and the world Europe in general. So there is certainly a connection. And of course, it's people. For me, it's also homecoming because of Her Excellency. I was privileged when I became ambassador here. My first assignment was to accompany Her Excellency on her trip to Russia, to the north. And I was never to the north of Russia myself. So it was an eye-opener. And the most brilliant speech I ever heard on what we people of the north have together was from Her Excellency at the Institute of Mining in St. Petersburg. And uh, it would be written in golden, you know, uh, letters in the annals of Russian-Canadian history. I was also very happy to present Russian state decorations to such outstanding Canadians as Her Excellency, Monsieur Chrétien, and some others. So there is a bond. 
And of course, uh, now when we're in a rough patch, our relations, I feel very sorry, and I believe I owe it to you to explain our position, not, you know, in propaganda terms. I'm an old man, I will soon retire, return to academic community, so I don't stand to risk much, frankly, to speak my own mind. <laughs> I don't need any instructions. I didn't receive many when I was ambassador here. And I don't think it's time to start now. So I think I owe it to you, my friends, Canadians, to explain certain things from our perspective. To give our side of the story. You know this famous saying, there are three sides to the story. Mine, yours, and facts. So I will try and give mine in 20 minutes and then let, me tear, uh, let you tear me apart. <laughs> I am quite happy because yeah, I know deep inside you really want to find out and to know and you want everything to come to a happy conclusion and Ukrainian people to live happily in sovereignty, be one country and deserve the freedoms that they were fighting for for such a long period. Of time. So I will start with history because I'm a historian by profession not that much of a diplomat. And uh, history always uh, uh, hurt me when I had negotiations with my American counterparts, with my Latin American counterparts, with my European counterparts, with my Canadian counterparts, because I'm an old man and I remember how it was and how positions of different government changes I'm not a public relations man who can say one thing today and then run from it tomorrow. It will continue to haunt and hide me, haunt, uh, haunt me, and will find me eventually. So my first, the first question that was asked of me, or rather it was rebuke when I arrived in Canada, was how can you, a representative of great, you know, cultured Russia, land of Lomonosov, Gagarin, and uh, Tolstoy be on the wrong side of history in Iraq. And my answer was, I believe it's a tragic mistake that my American friends made, and we must all try and do something about that. I always was trying, you know, to give a certain face saving for people who made mistakes, and I hope that this Cold War suspicions and legacy was behind us. Unfortunately, I proved to be wrong lately. But my appeal to you is, if you want to find, and it's rather a lamentary question, whether you're on the right or on the wrong side of history, try and learn history first. And then you will learn such simple things, that Russia as an entity was launched in Kyiv 2,000 years ago, not in Paris, not in London, not anywhere else. This is where so-called Rus started. Also, 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 you would understand that Russian Black Sea Fleet was not introduced by Putin several months ago, but stayed in Crimea for 300 years. You will also know that my country lost 30 million lives population approximately of Canada to fight fascism and, by the way, to help Ukrainians against fascism 70 years ago. And among two cities that were after Second World War 
proclaimed cities the heroes. There were Stalingrad, whom you all know, and Sebastopol, who probably you also learned about lately. So the blood that you know, soaks the land of Crimea is shared by our people. And it's a bond that you can't easily ignore. And what happens to current situation in Ukraine? First of all, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy because for many years after collapse of the Soviet Union, it was hard for Ukrainian people to establish a kind of governments that they deserve. It was equally hard for Russians. Such, you know, great changes as collapse of nation state with ideology, economy, social programs, everything. Alliances, they don't go easily. I remember in 1993, when I was heading an important delegation to negotiate nuclear arms with Americans, and then I would go to Ottawa and talk with my friends about some uh, very important issues of strategic stability. And I was driving to airport from downtown Moscow. It was tanks. It were tanks rolling down the streets of Moscow, 1993 shooting on the parliament where communists constituted the majority. And I remember how Canadians, Americans, and other our partners universally supported this move, which wasn't exactly a legitimate uh, parliamentary struggle move. So I know that such huge changes are dramatic and revolutions are messy. We call what happened in Kyiv in February coup. Others call it a revolution. As a historian, I know there is a very little difference. Some people call October 1917 revolution a coup. Some historians, some call it a revolution. By the way, I think your timing for this speech was perfect. Because as a historian, I want to remind you that on the 22nd of April, the greatest Bolshevik and revolutionary, Vladimir Lenin, was born. So it's an interesting historic irony that I uh, uh, address you on his birthday in the Royal Canadian Club. Because he is, of course, one of his uh, most cherished uh, uh, plans was to take apart Russian Empire and all the other empires, you know, for a company. So revolutions are messy. And after 1917 revolution, when Bolsheviks took uh, uh, power, some say during the coup, others say during the revolution in St. Petersburg, there were also three more governments simultaneously appeared in Russia, one in Kyiv, which was occupied by Germans uh, and supported by, you know, German army. Another government, and I mind you, in Crimea, government which was led by Tsar's general, held by French and Brits, for obvious reasons, who were always, you know, uh, very interested in uh, relations with Russia in Crimea. You remember it from Crimean War. The third and the next government was in the Far East, when Japanese helped another uh, Tsar's general to create a government. So there were four governments at the same time. And you can't expect revolutions or coups or whatever not to be messy. And unfortunately, as my old friend and direct, former director of Central Intelligence, Bob Gates, uh, who is a specialist, by the way, a Russian analyst, uh, used to say, you know, during revolutions, it's the most ruthless and organized that take power. And this is exactly what happened in our estimation in Kiev. What started as an anti-corruption 
revolution was hijacked by nationalists with very Russophobic agenda. The first move was ban Russian language. The second move was to fire constitutional court. And that's why, by the way, right now, whether you like it or not, there is only one legitimate president in Ukraine, according to Ukrainian constitution, Mr. Yanukovych. Yes, he is in. I, g give me, guys, guys, give me a chance. I will give you one later. You can make statements. Just don't throw pies at me. <laughs> whatever, or eggs, or whatever you have in your, at your disposal. I will give you a chance. That's why I volunteered to give you a chance to vent your frustration through questions. Because I won't give a take. I don't want to preach. I'm not a preacher. Unfortunately, I'm an atheist. So that's why we will have give and take. Uh, According to Ukrainian constitution, there are only three ways to dispose of your legitimate president. One, he writes his own abdication, which I don't suppose Mr. Yanukovych wants to do. Number two, there is an impeachment. But when you fire constitutional court, who will impeach? And number three, if he dies. And that unfortunately, was very close. He was shot on. He had to run for his life. <laughs> initially, initially to the regions where he believed he would be welcome. And then I'm not going to be his judge and to say that he should have, you know, muddled through, sent tough, organized, uh, uh, you know, uh, some... Uh, uh, groups in his favor, he was afraid. He saw what happened to Mr. Gaddafi and others, and he didn't want to follow suit with his family. His main aid wasn't prosecuted, you know, or anything else. He was shot in Kiev when he decided he can return and he was naive enough to uh, wait for some clemency. He was shot, and Mr. Uh, Yanukovych is equally afraid of that. So theoretically, there is only one legitimate guy there. The rest, from the standpoint of Canadian, uh, Ukrainian constitution, are just guys who took power. It happened in Russia in 1917. It happened, you know, in the United States many years ago and elsewhere. So it happens, but it's messy. And immediately, immediately, when these new authorities took control, their first move scared the daylights of the part of Ukraine where people speak Russian language and have traditional ties with Russia. Because the main slogan was, and I remember the headlines in local newspapers, that finally Putin or Russia lost, we have our guys in Kiev, and now they will be back to uh, West, they will be part of NATO, and so on and so forth. And the actions followed. And actions, of course, speak uh, louder than words. Russian language was banned. Later, Russian TV and radio programs went banned. Now it's difficult for a young Russian male and you know, we have very lax controls with Ukraine for historic reasons. It's very difficult for Russian male ages from 16 to 60 to enter Ukraine. Other things happened as well. And there was another revolution in Crimea. And I will, from historical, from historical, uh, Guys, huh? you, you will tell me everything you want about an action, you know, intervention. I read about it daily. I discuss it daily. So there is nothing you, new you can tell me. Listen to me for a change. Just for a change. Just give me a chance. Just give me a chance. Of course, people in Ukraine, you know, historically, 
it's not a country that uh, has the same history. Western part of Ukraine traditionally has more influence from Poland, France, you know, Great Britain, even during the Second World War, it was apparent. And eastern part of Ukraine is closer, in a closer association with Russian business, culture, and otherwise. And Crimea was always considered to be a part of Russia, historically. Why Khrushchev gave it away in 1954? I haven't heard anybody here discussing why he did it. Because it was one country, Soviet Union. He was a communist leader. He gave it to communist leader in Ukraine. So what was the reason? The reason, unfortunately, was a very, you know, murky one. Because Stalin died in 1953. And you know what a terrible monster Stalin was. I know it personally because he shot my grandfather. Others have other experience with that. And of course, my grandfather was an innocent man, you know, was a hero of the Second World War, but you know, those were the terrible purges that were conducted by Stalin. So when he died, many people who were closely associated with him in execution of innocent people, of sending millions to Gulag and otherwise, were shot. Not because of some justice suddenly prevailed, but people just didn't want to have evidence around. And one of the people, persons who was closest to Stalin, who was in charge of his purges, killing hundreds of thousands of people in Ukraine, was Khrushchev. It's not just, you know, a gossip. There are documents and archives that are signed personally by Khrushchev sending people to firing squad. So to try and distance himself when many people were killed and purged after Stalin died, he decided to make a gesture. For him, it didn't give, he didn't give any damn about the history of Crimea, that he was, uh, you know, uh, uh, dealing to these people like they were served, you know, giving for one baron to another, because those were inside one communist country. In 1991, when Soviet Union was about to fall apart, and people, of course, somebody is calling me from Moscow, please. <laughs> Take my instructions for me. It's all in Russian. There's a green light and a red light. I don't know which one to put. Be cautious. Don't start, don't start the Third World War. It may be about nuclear weapons. So in 1991, when for all reasonable people, it was obvious that if Soviet Union was to fall apart, Crimea should remain, of course, with Russia. But Mr. Yeltsin, President Yeltsin, was so involved, and I was present in Moscow at that time. I wasn't idling my life in Paris or in London. So I lived through it. He was involved in a bitter power struggle with Gorbachev, who tried to retain Soviet Union. And Yeltsin, of course, wanted to tear it apart, to take Russia out of the Soviet Union. So when the question of Crimea was raised between party boss Yeltsin, he was a party boss in Moscow, and head of the communists of Russia, and party boss of Ukraine about Crimea, Yeltsin didn't give a damn. He wanted to have all these regional party bosses on his side so that he can, you know, uh, defeat uh, Gorbachev, which he did eventually. So again, these people were like, you know, uh, uh, given away like serfs. And then there was not a very seemly story about 
constitution from Crimea, which was first adopted in 1992, then it was, you know, changed again. And when this revolution or putsch started in Kiev, and we had new version of Bolsheviks there with very nationalistic, anti-Russian attitudes. Of course, people in Crimea thought, why we can't do the same? And they did, and yes, there were Russian fleet there. And I will tell you what was there. There were 20,000 Russian troops in Crimea, and I personally negotiated this agreement because I'm an arms control geek, not only with nuclear weapons, I also participate in other negotiations like taking nuclear weapons from Ukraine. And if anybody is interested, I can give you a few funny facts about how it happened and who paid for it and who was at the far front of this negotiations. not Russians, by the way. Uh, uh, so uh, there were 20,000 Russian troops with the Black Sea Fleet and there were 20,000 Ukrainian th troops over there. And now, out of these 20,000 Ukrainian troops, only 3,000 decided to go back to Ukraine, and the rest is serving with the Russian army, which tells you something. And not only that, you remember during this uh, uh, little bloodshed in Kiev, during the coup, Berkut special forces were involved special Ukrainian forces, not special Russian forces, were involved. And of course, they were immediately disbanded after, you know, uh, new authorities took power. And many of them have families, and they went back to Crimea. So we didn't need to have any additional troops crossing border with Ukraine in Crimea. We already had all our troops there, and Ukrainian troops, who were quite prepared for independence of Crimea because they lived there and 80% of them were Russians. What happens now in Crimea? Not a single person killed, not any purges. First thing that we did to render Tatar ethnic community is rehabilitation. Almost like you did uh, uh, here with the uh, First Nations. We provided them with greater representation. We also, you have your chance, guys. That's why I asked for you to have an opportunity, not only to ask questions, make statements, make statements. Say it, say it, say it later. Give me another five minutes because otherwise my host is getting nervous. Uh, so, <coughs> these people now believe they came back home. Leo Tolstoy was mentioned here. But Leo Tolstoy didn't always o o only write war and peace. Leo Tolstoy also, was also a war correspondent in Sebastopol during the Crimean War. And if you want to learn about the close ties, historical, psychological, and otherwise, between Russians in Crimea and Russians elsewhere, read Tolstoy. Don't listen to me. Don't trust me or Harper or Putin. Read Leo Tolstoy. Because people like him don't lie. They are too genius for that. And you will understand this close ties and why people are so happy to be back in Russia. Now to Ukraine. What we want in Ukraine? We want united Ukraine. We don't want any divided Ukraine. Out of 150 million people who populate Russia, 25 million are Ukrainians. You have a million and a half here, and people are very you know, energetic, outspoken, and so on and so forth. Imagine when you have 25 million. It's quite a community with an interest, with divided families, and otherwise, another three million Ukrainians every year work in Russia. And they sent back home last year 
something like $20 billion. It's not a pittance if you take, you know, the sad state of Ukrainian uh, economy right now. So there are numerous ties. When you speak about airspace, when you speak about my favorite military industrial complex, we still have these ties. And we are very interested in stability in Ukraine. There is a lot of talk about Russian troops on the border of Ukraine. Of course, we are concerned because Ukraine is on the brink of civil war. Will we use them? I can give you my personal assurances. Our border the troops won't cross Ukrainian border. It's the last thing we want. It will be disaster, not for world community, not only, you know, for people in Canada who feel deeply about Ukraine. It will be total disaster for Russian identity, historic and otherwise. So what those troops are doing? They are preventing all the extremists to take vengeance on people who speak and do Russian. You may say, you know, it's a lot of fairy tales. Let's put it to the proof. And that's why it was Russia, not United States, not European Union, not even my favorite Canadian foreign affairs that were between, uh, behind organizing Geneva meeting on the 17th of April. And there was a broad agreement there that we must stop violence, that we must disarm those uh, extremist groups, that there must be effective constitutional reform so people in eastern Ukraine will feel equally, you know, uh, empowered as people in the western Ukraine. My host mentioned Joe Biden. I happen to know Joe Biden very well. He's a very interesting guy. Before he was in charge of Iraq, then he was in charge of Afghanistan, now he's in charge of Ukraine. God bless him. <laughs> I know him very well. He's a nice guy. Uh, but uh, uh, he also said in his speech, he, yes, he castigated Russia, you know, warned us, uh, which is to be expected. We also castigate Americans, warned them. It was my profession for 30 years. But he also said that we need a real constitutional changes in Ukraine. There, we need more autonomy for the Eastern uh, Ukraine so that they feel secure and participate in forthcoming presidential elections. We want nothing better than to have publicly elected legitimate new president for Ukraine with whom we can resume discussions and, you know, economic situation and terrible and so on and so forth. So this is what we want. It will be hard. There is a huge suspicion. People are fanning up, you know, into Russian hysteria. Stereotypes are very alive still. And I know it because, you know, we also have our lunatic fringe, our Tea Party in Moscow and elsewhere. And whenever I had to conclude important arms control negotiations with Americans, my chief opposition wasn't American military, because they aren't stupid enough to go to nuclear war with Russia. It was many people of certain, you know, Cold War upbringings back in Moscow, and I had to convince them. And I remember when we had hearings and ratifications of these treaties, I was publicly accused of treason and everything on the floor of my parliament. So I'm used to this stuff. I want through more difficult patches. And I only want us to work in concert to help Ukrainian people finally get the government they deserve. Because I'm absolutely convinced it's in the national interest, not only of Canada, the United States, European Union, but also of Russia. And we want Ukraine that will be on equally friendly terms with the West and with Russia, that will have to make this stupid choice between being friendly to Russia or being friendly to the West. I think it's hugely, you know, artificial and destructive just to impose this 
uh, choice on Ukrainians. And when I was last summoned to my friends in foreign affairs, and they regal, uh, regularly give me a dressing up, and of course I respond and tell them a couple of things that concern me about Canadian position, I told them, if you want to be serious players, if you want to help Ukrainians, if you want to be instrumental in national reconciliation in uh, uh, Ukraine, join the group. Be with us, Americans, European Union. Yes, we argue, but we're trying to do something. It's much harder than just standing on the sidelines and bad-mouthing everybody. Not to say that it's deeply offensive to people who lost, uh, you know, 30 million lives to be compared to Hitler or Germany. I will leave it to the conscience of those who, I mean, make such uh, terrible pronouncements. But I am absolutely certain. I am eternal optimist, probably because I presided over this uh, Cold War negotiations with Americans over nuclear arms when we were really close to the abyss on numerous occasions. I am absolutely certain that common sense will prevail, that we will cut through this hysteria, uh, suspicion, and that together we will help Ukrainians to come together and uh, live happily and be independent and not to be concerned either about Russian intervention or about, you know, Western imposition of certain people in government, whatever is the case. And uh, uh, I know that you must say something, you know, funny at the end. <laughs> Otherwise, people will go back to job, to their jobs, you know, under the weather and concern. <laughs> so, what's the symbol of Russia? Bear, right? Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, brown bear, sometimes black bear. In Canada, one of my most exciting encounters was in Churchill, the only north port of North America when there are a lot of white bears roaming about. And one of the things that I was shown when I came to Churchill was the prison for bears, where well, people are full of humanity. They don't shoot them when they come to Churchill trying to grab somebody and eat him. So they neutralize them and put them into prison when they spend from one to two months having just, you know, water, nothing else, which doesn't make them happy, but, you know, anyway, they survive. Then, again, they're put to sleep and taken back to tundra. And I saw there were different marks on their skins, black, white, gray, and otherwise. I said, what's the reason for that? They said, well, gray first time. Black, second time, red, repeat offenders. And you know, in the country that is so you know, famous for law and order, repeat offenders are under siege right now. And some of these bears who are repeat offenders, I was told, they came all the way from Russia. Can you imagine a thousand of kilometers? Because they liked it in churches so very much. So I think if Bears are so, you know, smart. People can be equally, you know, uh, understanding and come to an agreement and uh, uh, look at the space, look up, you know. Uh, unfortunately, I said I'm an atheist. When I look up, I am trying to trace the International Space Station. <laughs> and what's happening at the International Space Station right now at the height of all this, you know, hysteria and the talk about uh, global war and so on. Russians, Canadians, and others are working happily together. And they're being, you know, sent there by the Russian missile and backwards. So the only thing I want is to return to normality. Yes, there will be deep disagreements. People in this room, of course, I won't be able to convert you. But I was just trying to give you from historic standpoint, from the standpoint of guy who's been around and through much more difficult patches. There won't be a cold war. There won't be a hot war. Russian troops won't cross the border of Ukraine. 
but we will have to come to some important agreements to help Ukrainians determine their own future. Thank you very much. So, Ambassador, why don't you stay right there? Uh, so the ambassador has uh, agreed to take a number of questions. I'm sorry uh, for being so long-winded. That's I didn't okay. Want it was to probably strategic time. and it's a good move um, because we only have time for a few. So uh, with uh, discussion with the Ukrainian-Canadian uh, Congress, we're, we're going to take our first question uh, from Mr. Paul Grodd, the president of the Ukrainian-Canadian uh, Congress, and this is uh, obviously discussed with the ambassador in advance. And then we have time for, uh, I'd say, uh, about four, five, six questions. Uh, questions, not statements. Uh, we have time for probably one more, one of those long statement questions, uh, or four or five real questions. So uh, please use this time uh, appropriately. Mr. Grodd. Thank you. Ambassador Medvedov, I wanted to, uh, first of all, um, uh, thank you for coming and speaking to us. Um, I'm not going to debate your fantastical account of Ukrainian history or events in Ukraine. But what I do want to emphasize is that uh, looking at history as a historian, you can appreciate that when countries try to redraw their historical boundaries, because we, Europe, as you know, has changed dramatically over the last 300 years, those have led to world wars. And I would argue that uh, this is on the brink of another world war based on this redrawing of, of boundaries, which you are defending today, Ambassador. One thing I want to emphasize is the, uh, as the head of the Ukrainian community in Canada, uh, also somebody who's involved with the Ukrainian World Congress, uh, we meet with our counterparts, this large Ukrainian community in Russia. And I have to tell you, Ambassador, that they are very, very afraid. They have uh, recently experienced significant um, um, human rights abuses, uh, which I'm happy to talk to you about in further detail. Uh, and also, just most recently, about a year ago, the Federation of Ukrainians in Russia was disbanded and never allowed to re re recreate itself. So the Ukrainian minority in Russia faces significant challenges, and I would argue significantly greater challenges than the ethnic minorities in Russia do. Um, what I want to emphasize is that we empathize and support the people of Russia and in their attempts to create a true democracy to live in freedom and human dignity, which the Ukrainian people have now been fighting for for the last two decades. And we believe that with democracy and freedom in Russia, the rest of the world will be able to live freely, as will the people of Ukraine. But really what I, and perhaps these are the reasons why, in these statements that I make, is perhaps the reason why, Ambassador, where, uh, that I've been sanctioned by, uh, by your government and uh, your president. And this sanctioned by, I was sanctioned uh, very recently, and um, I have to say that the Prime Minister of Canada, Prime Minister Harper, came out very critical of this censure. And if I may just quickly quote two sentences where well, he says... Well, mind a question. Sure. Well, let, let, it really has to do with uh, the sanctions. Let gentlemen finish, you know. It's it has to do with... unique opportunity, because uh, I never heard from him before. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, the Prime Minister of Canada quoted this by saying, just recently after I was sanctioned, Putin has decided to censure the elected leader of the Ukrainian community in Canada. What did he do? That indicates the mentality of Putin's government, their lack of respect not only for Ukraine as a country, but also of Ukrainians as members of a real nation. This is fundamental. It demonstrates why Ukrainians are so resistant to the relationship between Russia and their country. Ambassador, as the only non-parliamentarian, as the only non-government official that was part of the 13 Canadians that were sanctioned by, uh, by your president, your government, I'd like to understand why that happened, Ambassador. Well, first, all these sanctions are stupid. And they were started not by us, but by your side. It's like, you know, in diplomatic community, if they kick up, uh, out our diplomat, we will kick yours. It's, uh, you know, like in playoff hockey. When a uh, referee makes a mistake and uh, somebody goes to the penalty hall, sooner they will redress, sooner or later. The same is here. Why you in particular? I don't know, probably you were more vocal in comparing Russia to Nazi Germany. Who knows? Uh, I, I don't know uh, uh, what, why uh, our uh, speaker of Senate was sanctioned, very nice lady, on the verge of coming to Canada 
uh, Ukrainian, by the way, by descent, why was she sanctioned? She can ask the same question as you. It's a stupid uh, policy which was launched by uh, West and uh, uh, there is a certain diplomatic dance uh, where everybody reciprocates. I, I think it's stupid, we're against sanctions. We didn't start that. So ask her, Madam Matvienko why she was sanctioned. Question, where's the microphone, sorry? At the very back, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Yevgeny Savchenko. I'm um, a student from Monk School of Global Affairs. First of all, thank you very much, Ambassador, for coming to uh, do your presentation. Uh, second of all, thank you to the Empire Club for inviting the Ambassador to uh, give us a uh, opposing viewpoint on the situation. Uh, my question has to do with the sanctions and this harsh rhetoric going back and forth between Western nations, the Russian Federation, Ukraine, and so on and so forth. It seems that uh, there's a greater element of confrontation rather than collaboration, cooperation that are needed in time of crises. Um, how are you uh, and the Russian government planning to um, develop uh, an element of collaboration and confrontation instead of um, trying to fight with everybody? Well, I really appreciate that it comes from the younger generation. Uh, I have uh, four grandchildren, and I hope they will be much smarter than our generation is, and that by the time they will become somebody, politicians, diplomats, businessmen, they will exercise all these demons of the Cold War. So, again, you know, I can only tell you, we don't want the sanctions. We didn't start them. But we have to reciprocate so people won't believe that they can, you know, uh, uh, just throw us around. And uh, I don't expect much to come of these sanctions. It never did, you know, in my experience, quite substantial experience in world affairs. There were sanctions. I remember when my American friends sanctions, uh, sanctioned us for fighting Taliban that they created in uh, Afghanistan against Soviet Union. We were fighting bin Laden, Taliban, and we were sanctioned, and so on and so forth. The net result was, unfortunately, that everything turned around. Americans have to go into Afghanistan, and we had to help them go there and fight Taliban and Bin Laden. And again, it started with American and Western sanctions. So uh, they are not effective, but I can assure you, because I know there's a lot of business people here, and they call me from time to time without naming name, and they're concerned that some, you know, well-developed business will sanction because Russia will overreact with something crazy, confiscate something in response to what Americans and others are doing. We won't do that. We are not crazy. We think about future, and future is not with sanctions, but with cooperation, and we won't undercut the business which is trying to build bridges, and bridges will bring better understanding, including on Ukraine, on other issues. Like I said, it's our cherished dream to have the closest possible integration between Russia and European Union. So why should we be so foolish as to prevent Ukraine from achieving the same goal that we are striving after? And in this case about sanctions, like I said, we didn't initiate them. We believe they will be totally ineffective because half of Russia, as you know, is in Asia and the Chinese are willing to buy everything that we're selling to Europe right now. But we don't want to hurt this relationship. We want to diversify. Like you now want to move to China, you don't want to put all the eggs in the American basket after you were burned by the crisis. 
The same is true about us. We're also trying to be pragmatic and we want to retain good relationship with North America, with the uh, uh, European Union. And I can tell you as an ambassador, because I am being asked by Moscow very often what to do in response to sanctions, because people are irked, you know, speakers and others who are not allowed to travel abroad, whose, you know, relatives are hurt, even, you know, uh, children. And my response is and will always be, don't try and repeat the mistakes of others. We should think about future. Let's leave business alone. If we have to deal with politicians, if we have to go through this sing and dance, let us. But business should be a sacred cow. Thank you. If you stay, I'm not sure what's longer, a Ukrainian question or a Russian answer, but um, <laughs> if you state your name uh, and your title, that'd be great. My name is Alex Yemitz. I'm a Canadian of Ukrainian heritage. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for this opportunity. I have a question. Are you not embarrassed to represent a government that tells outright lies to the global community, to heads of state and to its own people, that has uh, broken their commitment to protect the integrity of Ukraine's borders from the 1994 Budapest Memorandum, and that provides safe harbor for murderers and thieves, Yanukovych, Pshonka, and others? I'd like to hear your answer. Uh. Thank you, sir. I must confess I'm embarrassed, but I'm embarrassed on your behalf. Because what you say today, I heard from my bosses, communist bosses in the Soviet Union for 70 years. And now I see repetition only in another form. It's a pure propaganda. If you want to ask, if you want to ask a question, ask a question. If you think I am concerned about being on the wrong side of history, I already told you about Afghanistan, I told you about uh, 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 sanctions that were imposed on us because we were fighting uh, Chechen terrorists and after Boston Marathon, all special services from North America, from France, everybody are banging on our door asking how we can cooperate to fight these Chechen separatists. Don't forget that there were times when people went to the stake because they believed that world is not flat. So I'm not afraid to say that world is not flat. If you still believe it, God bless you. Question in the corner. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for your Orwellian history lesson. Um, I would like to ask you about the future. First, in my hand here, I have a 200-page documented proof that the Russian Black Sea Fleet was used as an anchor to spur separatism since 1994. Four. Now about the future. We see what this fleet has done. Would you please tell us a little bit about Russia's plans for the international globalized world? What do you think of the rule of law? And what do you think that the Russians have planned with their navy and the programs that they have in Venezuela and Syria? Thank you. Well, uh, what I believe in is that world is going to be a big village. I also believe that we shouldn't try and impose our ideological, narrow, confrontational agenda on people in the world, because out of seven billion people, six billion live in misery, in hunger, in ailments, and otherwise, and what is probably the worst tragedy and uh, confrontation for us is just nothing to them. So for me, it's important not to lose sight of those six billion underprivileged, and that's why, though I'm an atheist, and I know there's a lot of Protestants in this room, one of my favorites today is Pope Francis, who cut through all this, you know, rhetoric, all these social disagreements, uh, and tries not to concentrate on uh, uh, controversial issues, but points to what is really important, to take care of the poor. I'm afraid that we, because we so, have such a channel vision, 
we don't appreciate the events that happened since the global crisis of 2008. And one of the net results was more poverty, radicalization of world community everywhere. And it's not only nationalists that appear in Eastern Europe. You can look, you know, at France, you can look at other countries, analyze the latest elections, you can uh, analyze what happened in Norway, you can analyze why Swedish fascists uh, uh, crowded in Kyiv after February. It's not in Russian newspapers, it's in Swedish newspapers. My second language is Swedish. So from time to time I read Swedish newspapers. So there is a radicalization and the growing gap between the poor and very rich. And this is a substantial issue. And the sooner we are able to come a diplomatic solution and help Ukrainian people elect a legitimate government and help them economically and help them with constitutional reform so they will uh, avert civil war, live in peace, the sooner we will be able to take care of this greater global issues that I'm very concerned about, whether it's environment or global poverty, because if you look at trouble spots, Afghanistan, Syria, uh, Libya and others, it's exactly the post where the misery is the most graphic. It's not because people are ideological or only ideological, not only because of the fundamentalist religion beliefs, it's of poor misery. And people in the age of uh, information revolution went through the smartphone, you can get connected to anybody in the world. They, they don't, won't stand up for that anymore. And the sooner we are able to uh, normalize situation around Ukraine and help Ukrainians with their uh, electing, you know, a democratic government, the sooner we will be able to take care of global issues. I'm afraid we only have time for one last question. Uh, if would you please rise and state your name. And, uh... Emily Bayrachny, Ukrainian World Congress. Mr. Ambassador, uh, thank you. I'd like to thank you for your talk uh, again. Uh, forgive us if we don't take your, your word as truth, given Russia's atrocious human rights record and uh, your foreign policy decisions. Um, and I'm sure educated citizens in the world find Russia's claims to want to collaborate quite weak. Um, but my question for you is uh, very simple. You claim your goal and Russia's goal in cooperation and is cooperation in Ukraine right now. Um, but how can you uh, claim that when uh, Russia just expelled another Canadian diplomat today from Moscow. Um, I understand if you still haven't gotten the official rhetoric from Mr. Putin, but please give us your thoughts. What's the latest? Can you speak up a little bit? Canadian diplomat. No, no, no. Rubbish. Rubbish. Guys, my friend just took a call from Moscow. He can <laughs> reassure you on this point. Because if Canadian ambassador, I have a selfish interest. If Canadian ambassador is kicked out, immediately I won't be able, I will have to, you know, uh, to ask uh, Her Excellency uh, pardon for not being able, I mean, uh, to talk to her later this year. I will have to go back to Moscow just to ask my wife to pack up. And I'm standing here, you see, relaxed. So uh, rubbish. Very simple question, answer, rubbish. Thank you, Ambassador. I don't know how it, you can say it in uh, Russian. Not a senior Canadian diplomat. Uh, it's another story. You read it in newspapers. Canadians uh, expelled uh, our uh, guy from a staff of military attaché, so probably we also kicked out some military spy from Moscow. Simple stuff. <laughs> Nothing relevant in my line of job when I discuss serious security issues. Thank you. thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And especially thank you for the provocative questions because they made me think. Thank you. And I'd like to remind everyone that didn't get a chance to answer, ask your question that there is a videographer out, out 
in the, in the main reception area. We're doing a photo booth style Q&A, and you're welcome uh, to uh, provide your thoughts to the Russian and Canadian governments. I'd like to now call on Dr. Gordon McIver to say a final appreciation on behalf of the club. Thank you, Noble. Ambassador, uh, Your Excellency Adrian Clarkson, colleagues, uh, board members from the Empire Club, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, your speech today marks the second in our new ambassador series, which will see ambassadors from several countries important to Canada address our club this year. There's the obvious ones like Great Britain, the United States, India, and China, uh, which have all been invited. But we wanted to start this series with ambassadors from, uh, from the Ukraine and Russia because of the extraordinary events obviously occurring in your region, and uh, the whole world is paying a lot of attention. Now, we obviously, as the President said, don't make policy at the Empire Club. That's the job of our own government. We also don't take positions on issues of public controversy, nor have we ever done this. Our President made that quite clear in his introductory remarks. But that does not mean in any way that each and every one of us today doesn't have personal feelings on these issues. We're Canadian, we're polite, but we certainly all have our feelings. And, uh, and that's why it's so important to bring people in positions of power, which is our mandate, to bring people in positions of power and influence to speak to Canadians and by so doing let them make more informed choices about what's going on in the business, political, science and cultural fields. Now looking back over our historical records at the Empire Club, because we are a club of record and we've got 110 years of records, it's absolutely astounding to me how many numerous times the club has looked at Russia and before that the Soviet Union over the years. Issues between regions within the Soviet Union and later issues between former Soviet bloc countries uh, that have been looked at many, many times over the past, uh, past century uh, or 110 years at this podium. So uh, why this is historically true, why we've looked at these issues is because they're there and they've always been very numerous compared to other countries and I think that's what is of particular interest to, to this club in having you, Mr. Ambassador, here today. Ambassador, given the situation occurring in Ukraine as we speak, as well as the Canadian government and the Canadian people's reaction to this situation, some wondered how we would thank you at the end of your speech, delivered at a time when the world watches with grave concern a geopolitical situation that has been described as ugly, complex, and terribly messy. So our thank you to you today is for coming to talk to us about the incumbent Russian government's position on these events. From that perspective, you've done your job, and we have indeed done ours. So thank you very much for traveling to Toronto today, Mr. Ambassador, and one last word, if I may, and it may be the only thing that everyone in this room will hopefully agree upon today, and that is may a good, may a good sense and peace prevail in your region of the world. I think that's something that we all hope for. Thank you. Your Excellency, as a token of our appreciation and on behalf of the club, we'd like to present you with this book. It's a, a book of 100 years of speeches of the Empire Club. Uh, and ironically, uh, uh, Viktor Yushchenko and uh, President Putin are both listed in this book because they both spoke at the club. Um, at your desks, you'll find a list of upcoming events. Tomorrow, we have Rob Pritchard, chair of Metrolinx, uh, speaking about uh, transit in the Greater Toronto Area. On Monday, April 28th, we have Premier Kathleen Wynne uh, speaking about jobs and prosperity. Uh, on the same day, uh, we have Dr. Jeff Taylor, Chief, Ch Chief Scientist of Poet Technologies, uh, speaking about semiconductors and the future of computing. I'd like to thank, about, uh, thank the National Post as our print media sponsor, Van Valkenburg, for providing our AV. This meeting will be carried on Rogers TV. We're very grateful for their ongoing support. We're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we have a website, uh, which is empireclub.org, and membership information is available to you there. And we hope that uh, this talk and others that you've followed over the years uh, might uh, persuade you to join our club. Thank you all for coming, Your Excellency. Uh, thank you for being here. This meeting of the Empire Club of Canada is now adjourned without incident.